house of the Lord, his wife, or two of the five cars. And the first week I came here, our friend came to us every year, and I got a friend card and it's still good for me. And I was about to say, you can't get a paper card for this. Yes, sir. How in the world would I not be surprised? Had to be revealed. Before the foundation of the world, even I was a sinner then, I wasn't even saved to stay with God. One of God didn't slay me. I was born in Stonington, Illinois, September 22nd, 1924, and it's mid-state Illinois. And um, I always, I had gone to Sunday school and church. My grandmother Griffith was a free Methodist, and I'd go to, to church with her. I went up to the altar a few times, uh, but my parents, neither one, were going to church. They uh, didn't feel that they had find enough clothes or things to go to church. And my, my mother raised me um, most generally. I think my daddy gave me one spanking in my life. My mother, it was her no's and yeses, and my clothes was all, my mind was made up. She'd make up my mind for me. And um, I went to Sunday school and church, sang in the youth choir, sang in the adult choir when I got in high school. And I went around with some um, minister's daughters, but they would try to teach me how to smoke. Um, and I kind of knew that that was wrong. But then in, um, after I graduated from high school, my folks moved to Joliet, Illinois. And um, I started working in an office and the girls would uh, go and have drinks. Well, my dad and mother neither one drank. 
and my daddy wouldn't have a, a drink with the president, he would tell me. He wouldn't go across the road to have a drink with the president. So it was hard for him to understand me. But I don't know if I was balking at authority or if I wanted to make up my own mind or if it were God's power to show what he can do. I, I don't know. I don't know why it happened to me, although I, I know that um, he found a way where there was no way for me. When I moved to Joliet, I started working and I started um, going out with the girls. They would have drinks and naturally I would be ahead of them in, in the drinking. Um, and I, even though I was ashamed of it, when they were gone to the washroom or something, I'd have an extra few drinks. Um, and I knew it was wrong, but I could forget and it was like I put on rose-colored glasses. It was just different. And finally, I got to the place, I only drank about two and a half years, but I had got to the bottom of my ladder. I, I couldn't have gone any farther. And if I were not in Jesus today, then I, I, I'm sure I could never uh, tell you because I got so I didn't have any appetite. I, uh, my weight had went down. I had no strength. I lost my job. My daddy would plead with me to, uh, he said, sis, help yourself. And my mother would be very dogmatic, but I'd say, well, I just can't help me. There's no way that I can help me. And I resented the fact that I was held um, beyond my own wishes. I wanted uh, control or the reins in my own hand, and I didn't have it in my hands. I could feel myself slipping. And this is real. This is genuine. And no one that's never been there, they will never understand it. But I um, had been in a number of hospitals in Joliet, in Chicago, suburban. And one time there was five earthly doctors had walked away from my bed and said I would never live. And one doctor went so far, he said that uh, if I did live, that in six months my mind would snap. I would never make it. And my mother, just in oh, a short time before this, had become a Christian. She was going to Nazarene church. She was fasting and praying. and She worked um, at Hart Schaffner and Marks and would take her lunch hour and go and fast and pray and ask God to heal. My body, help me. She didn't, we weren't taught healing, but she said, make her well, Lord. Um, she'd go in a little church basement and pray alone. And then she said, Lord, if you'll use her after she's saved. Well, then it was just a, oh, a little while after that that um, a Christian bus driver there in Joliet said, Rosella, tell your mother that there is a meeting in Hammond, Indiana, where a real man of God is preaching. He's praying for the sick. He's... Um, uh, the lame walks, the blind sees, cancers are healed, everything is done in Jesus' name. And I said, well, Joe, I never heard anything like that in my life. I went to the Methodist church. He said, Rosella, this is a person and his name is Jesus. Well, I thought all my life I went to church as a kid, but where was Jesus in it? I, I knew the scriptures, I knew the songs, but I didn't know him. So then, after Joe had witnessed to us and told us about the meeting that Brother Branham was holding in Hammond, Indiana, uh, I tried the next day to get a hold of his wife, and he said three or four or five cars was going every day from Joliet, and we were welcome to go. So I called the second day, and they had left early to go to the afternoon meeting and the evening meeting. The third day, I called Bernice, and I asked her, I said, uh, are you going to Hammond, Indiana, to the meeting? And she said, yes, did you want to go? And I said, oh, my, we sure would. 
So we went over, and she was telling me what all God had done for them. And I was so bored, I thought, oh, land, I didn't feel comfortable because I didn't know him. I, so I thought, well, I'll just endure these people till I get over to the meeting. And um, we walked in, and the meeting had already been in progress, the afternoon meeting, and those people were shouting. Um, there was such a shine on their face that such a happiness that I never had in my whole life. And um, I thought, well, they're kind of noisy, but still in all, they, they've got to have something that I don't have. Well, I bowed my head that afternoon, and I didn't know healing was of God, but I asked God to make a way for me to, um, if it was his will to heal me, for him to make a way. Well, that afternoon when the meeting was dismissed and um, Brother Billy Paul came by and uh, he asked me, did I need a prayer card? And I said, yes. And he asked me what was wrong. And I told him that I was an alcoholic. The doctors had given me up and they said that there was no hope for me. And um, he wrote on the card. Well, we went out and had something to eat and we came back to the meeting. Well, that afternoon, though, I said, I know, in my heart, I knew that it, when I stood before Brother Branham that I'd be all right. I knew it. There was just something, there's no way that you can explain it, but I knew that I'd be all right. But then, right after that, something said, yes, Rosella, that's true. You could be healed and stand before this man, but looky, you walk up and every individual in this auditorium will know what's wrong with you. And that was a real shame that I had to face. But I thought, Lord, whatever it takes, and you giving me grace, I'm going. We went back for the evening meeting then, after we'd had lunch. And Brother Branham preached his message. Um, he preached, come see a man. I asked him later what it was, and he said, come see a man, was the message that he preached. And... Uh, he compared card J25 to J50 after he had completed his message. And um, nobody had to take me up to there. I went on my own. No one had to show me where to go. I went by myself. And I said, I'm going, and I know that I'll be all right. And when it was, I was third in line, I had J27. And when I stood there waiting my turn, um, as I approached Brother Branham, I, I sensed a presence that was there that I can't define to you, but I know that was there. Um, and when I stepped before Brother Branham, he was the kindest man I had ever met, the kindest individual that I had ever seen in my life. And he said, do you believe me to be God's prophet? And I said, yes, sir. He said, um, if God reveals to me what's the matter with you, and if Jesus heals you, will you serve him the rest of your life? And I said, yes, sir. And he stepped back and he said, you're an alcoholic. He told the whole auditorium to bow their head and pray. And when he did, he laid his little hand on my head, and he asked the Lord to heal me in Jesus' name. What he cared for. So much that he told her the secrets of her heart and forgive every sin and put something in her that she run into the city saying, Come see a man that's told me the things that I've done. See, that's what makes him great to me. He is a stuffed shirt. He was God's grace to the people. He was God's love expressed in human flesh. No matter how little or insignificant he cared. Immoral, drunks, alcoholics, whatever it was. I think of little Rosella Griffin. In Chicago, her book's coming out now. There came into the meeting so vile to the, the great alcohol synonymous that turned her down. And about six or eight famous hospitals of Chicago had rolled her name off the book never to come there. Even till she was so low. 
until the only thing she had left was a coat that her mother gave her. She cut it on the inside and put her bottles down in there, such an alcoholic that she might not freeze to death laying in the gutters at night time. A young woman, smart, educated, miserable Hank, sitting in the balcony up yonder in Indiana where we was having a meeting. No one seemed to care. If they knew who it was, they moved back from her. But Jesus cared. He moved me around and said, The woman sitting yonder, her name is Rosella Griffin. She's an alcoholic. She's been given up by the synonymous. And they can't do nothing for her. And she, all hopes is gone. But she's believed on him. Thus saith the Lord, from this hour on, no more alcohol. And now she's a sweet, loving Christian from place to place and from dive to dive. From jail to jail, preaching the gospel to save alcoholics. Jesus cares. So just cast your cares upon him. In your sorrow, he cares. When you lose your loved ones, he cares. He cares for the dead, those who've died in Christ. One day he was so weary in his way, he could hardly go. But there come a, a band from the city. A funeral procession and a little mother frantically throwing her hands in the air and wringing them. Oh, Jehovah, why did you take him? He's my only son. He was tired and weary, but he cared for that poor little heartbroken woman. Walked over to the, the carriers that, that carried the, the casket and touched it and said, Sunrise! Why? He cared. He understands. Now, we know by his life that he cares. Now, the question is for us tonight, do you care? He cares. But now, do you care? If you do not care, then he can't help you. But if you care enough, or care enough about yourself. I've heard people make this insane remark. I don't care what becomes of me. Oh, my. I sure be care what becomes of me. Sure I do. I care. Now, I believe any person in their right mind cares. I want to know what's going to happen to me. And if I know he loved me, then no one else could love like that. He cares for you. He cares for you no matter how little you are, how insignificant you are, how poor, how indifferent, how many times you've tried and failed. He still cares. His love still knocks at your heart's door. But are we ungrateful for that? Now, as far as I know, every person in the presence here is absolutely total strangers to me. I've seen... A little, I believe it's this Rosella. Is that you sitting there, Rosella? Have you ever given your testimony around this meeting? At Hammond, I believe it was, Indiana. One night in the balcony or somewhere, I don't remember where it was, Fred Astaire's dancer had just been exposed at the audience. And in there somewhere, a little lady come, nervous, trembling, and the Holy Spirit spoke to her, and told her she's an alcoholic and on her road to torment and whatever he told her, I don't know. But that girl had been given up by doctor after doctor, alcohol, synonymous and everything. And Jesus Christ in his mercy took that alcohol, prayed from that girl, and she's one of God's chosen saints tonight for the last three or four years, has walked Chicago and all kinds of byways and everything else and give testimony to the grace of God. Tonight, sitting here, saved by the grace of God, humble, loving, Christian, beautiful young woman. Would you mind just standing up, Rosella? I don't want to make you a, a, a pointing out block. That's what the grace of God can do. Hallelujah. Certainly it is. That's the only one that I know of just now in the audience, but my recording boys and Brother Beeler sitting here. But the Holy Spirit knows each one of you. He knows who you are, what you have a desire for. He's certain. You can know it to be that he is, if he never performs any more miracle on you, but the great miracle forgives your sin. Amen. That's the greatest miracle that God ever performed, yes. was to forgive a human being its sin. 
Take a man and convert him from the things that that's changes his innermost being. From the things that he wants, drink and gamble and done evil and things like that, and all of a sudden turns him right back around to love and goes home to his wife and says, Honey, I'm sorry that I treated you like that. Pick up his little children and hold them in the arm. Daddy spent all his money for whiskey and daddy's done this and and mother's been out all night long and left you children. I'll never do it again. God forgive me. And how that testimony, that's one of the greatest uh, things in there. All the alcoholics phenomenists and all like that can never change like that. <laughs> they can never do for the person. Look at little old Rosella Griffin. You're there sitting there with all the phenomenists in uh, uh, Chicago. Four of the major hospitals, their staff of doctors that gave her out in one moment's time on the platform. Change that batty eyed wretch. Stand there with coat cut like this, a mink coat on, where her mother bought her. She's a smart girl and carried her whiskey bottles down in that coat there and afraid she'd fall on the street and freeze to death before somebody could find her. There, stand there when all the synonymous and all would give her up. She's writing a book on it now. There she come on the platform. The Holy Spirit said to her, Your name is Rosella Griffin. No uncertainty about that. <laughs> You're an alcoholic. You've been the synonymous and everything. But thus saith the Lord. It's over now. And that lady sitting up here on the balcony. She's a Fred Astaire's dancer partner. She jumps up. That's right. She's also an alcoholic and a dope fiend. The Lord's looking for her now. And her daddy said, I resent that. She said, wait a minute, daddy. The man's right. No uncertainty about that. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. You're healed. Dig yourself up. Now she's out on the field with her husband preaching the gospel. Oh, my. What is it? Jesus Christ the same yesterday, yes, today, Lord. forever. Yes. In the days when the denomination gives the uncertainty of it, yes. why would we listen to a church denomination when Christ remains yes. the same? Amen. No uncertain about that. It's always certain. Now, to all those doctors, that was such a problem. To the ministers, I'd gone up to the altar and wasn't saved. But just one minute in front of a man of God that really knew where he stood. I left that platform. I was so happy. I knew that I was healed. I knew it. And before I got off the steps, there's a little lady coming with bloodshot eyes. She's crying so. And she said, oh, honey, I feel so sorry for you. I said, lady, you don't need to. I said, Jesus has just healed me, and I'm just fine. I'm just fine. And I asked her three different times what was wrong with her daughter. She wanted me to call her. She says, well, she's a dope addict. And I said, well. And I got her address and telephone number. And, and Mama said going home that night, she said, oh, Rosella, don't get mixed up in dope now. You've, you're all right. Just leave it alone. Well, that was one of the costly things that I learned. To go and do what God said, not what people says. Because my mother told me not to call her. I called her. The next day, and that girl came and was healed the next evening after I was healed. Well, that night I went home, and we stopped for pie or ice cream or something going home, and I was so shut in with the Lord that I don't know to this day what I had. I don't remember. I got home, and I, I said to the Lord, I know that I'm healed, Lord, but just show me that I'm saved. I didn't know the Scripture says that when you're healed, it's a sign that your sins be forgiven you. But... Anyway, that night I, I said, Lord, I'm so sorry that I, I, I've, I've not really went to church since we moved from Stonington. And, and just just uh, forgive me for every sin that I've ever created and committed against you in this life. Take me in, Lord. And as I was laying on that bed with my human body laying on the bed, and a, that was a genuine me, there was another genuine me lifted up and out of my body and went up real soft and easy and left my body. Went almost to the ceiling of the room. And I was fearful and I cried and my mother came and she said, oh, Roselle, go back to sleep. That was just, um, you just was saved. Well, that didn't satisfy me. So the next day we went to the meeting, the next day I called that little girl and we went to the meeting 
she got a prayer card, and she came looking for me, and she said, will you take me to the prayer line? I said, sure. She, she said, oh, well, I do. And I said, if you ever did anything in your life, believe Jesus Christ. Believe him. Trust him. She went through. She said, I'll try. So she, as she went through the line, Brother Branham, she was under a disguise, and the Holy Spirit called it out because she, her real name was Helene Proctor, but she was going by the name of Shirley King, and Brother Branham called it out. Anyhow, she was healed that next night. Now, I went home again, and I asked the Lord to show me again that I was saved. I wanted to be his child. I wanted to serve him. I didn't want to be unreal and be in the world. I wanted to... And through it all, now, I never was immoral, but I was, I was just uh, miserable in the state I was in. I asked the Lord after I was healed, I said, Lord, if you put those doctors that gave me up and said there was no hope for me in my path, I promise you, Lord, that I'll testify to every one of them. And uh, there was Dr. Polychondriotis, a Greek doctor, a very educated, good man. And I said, Doctor, where you doctors did not find a help for me, I went to Jesus, and he healed my body. And two of those doctors agreed with me. They said, well, Rosella, you go right ahead and believe that. I said, by his grace, I'll do it the rest of my life. I'll serve him. And... Uh, that next day, then, Helene went to the, per, through the prayer line, and she was healed. And uh, then we, we used to see one another at the meetings, and it was so wonderful. The meeting lasted 14 more days. But Brother Branham had told Brother Beeler the next day after I was healed, he said, what God sent me for just happened last night. He said, that, and he'd tell me later, he said, Sister Rosella, that figures, one out of a setting, one out of a setting. I didn't really un understand what he meant, but... I believed what he said. I never did have to figure out what he said. I just believed it. And then after that, I prayed and I asked the Lord to give me a good job and ask him not to let me get into any trouble, open the door that was of him and close every other door. I started working in the office and I asked for raises. I'd get automatic raises. I had uh, one of the best friends I've had in this life was a little Catholic girl. And they'd say, Rosella's too strict, and she won't say naughty words, and she won't do this, and she won't do that. But Bonnie said, yes, but Rosella will pray for you if in case that you need help. And uh, she was a real friend to me. And Bonnie just went to be with the Lord, and I'm convinced that I'll see her over there. Because she was good to me, and I was good to her. I loved her. And she was walking in all the truth that she knew. And she'd keep asking me, Rosella, are you going to the meeting? Are you going to the Easter meeting? And I'd say, yes. And then after that, why, I'd keep praying and keeping close to the Lord and asking Him to guide my life. And the Lord showed me before never to put my name on a church book. Uh, then my daddy started coming in. My dad started going to the meetings with us. And one week after I was healed, I was sitting up in the balcony, and I asked the Lord to heal the man that Bernice took that was her uncle. He was an alcoholic. I said, Lord, heal him just like you did me. And Brother Brown looked up in the balcony and said, uh, that girl up there is praying for you. And, um, and I nodded my head. He said, uh, why, he said, you were healed on this platform. Isn't that right? And I nodded my head. Well, then uh, he said, uh, you have somebody else at your daddy sitting on the right-hand side of you. Have him to uh, lay your hand over on him, him to accept his hearing and salvation. Oh, God, have pity on the sick and the needy. How that he would, his mercy endureth. How do you do, sir? All right. Now... I am a stranger to you. Is that right, sir? Yes, sir. I, I, I don't know you. I, you're a stranger to me, so I just, as far as I know, I've never seen you. I, if I have, I, I don't, I'm not acquainted with you. Or, but the, there is someone who knows us both. Isn't that right, sir? He knows us both. And, uh, and you've come here tonight to be healed or whatever is wrong. And there's no way at all for me to know anything in the world about you, only lest God would reveal it in some way. You believe that? Yes. You, you do. And, um, and uh, will you, with sincerity of heart, 
Do you believe that what you have heard about Jesus Christ being the Son of God is the truth? Yes. You do. And do you believe that what the claim that I have made concerning his being his prophet by a vision to this end I was born, do you believe that's the truth? You believe it, even though I would not say a thing, what is wrong with you or nothing, but just pray for you and pass on, you'd believe it anyhow, wouldn't you? Maybe he might uh, be able to explain. Yes, sir. As soon as the Holy Spirit, which you are sure that there's something near, you're not accustomed to this feeling. You're a, a, a nervous person. Say... I see you coming from a distance. You've come from somewhere here. Isn't that right? Yes. You're not, you're, you've, you've come from some other place coming here. Yes. You was away and come here. Somebody has brought you here or told you to come here. Yes. And you've not, you have, you're here to be delivered of a, something that you do. Yes. Isn't that right? It's something that's ruining your life and wrecking your life. Is that right? Yes. Which is drinking. That's right. You're an alcoholic. Yes. And somebody has told you, and if I'm not mistaken, you was north and come south. Come in here. Is that right? Yes. You accept him as your savior now? Yes. Believe that from this hour, he's the only thing that can take this thing away from you? All right. You now accept him as your Savior. You now believe that he is the Son of God and he died at Calvary to take away your sins. And you don't want to do that. You're only ruining yourself, sending yourself to a devil's hell and a sinner's grave. And, and you don't want it to be that way. And it's got you all nervous and shook up. Is that right? That's right. Now, you accept him as your Savior. Yes. And now, do you believe then if I'll ask God that that devil will leave you? What I'm thinking about... There's been somebody who's healed, and I believe I see her sitting up there, a, a little alcoholic was healed here not long ago, sitting right up there in a meeting somewhere. If I turned around and felt, is that right if it is? Stand up, lady. Uh, it's somewhere right. That's right. Exactly. Uh, you're sitting there praying for that man. That's right, isn't it, lady? I'm not reading your mind, but I've seen you sitting there. Haven't you been healed on this platform of the same thing? Your spirit is having to get lined together. Say, somebody else you're praying for, isn't that your dad sitting near you there? Is that right? Is that right? He's hard of hearing, isn't he? Lay your hand over on him. You accept Jesus as your Savior too, Dad? All right, go home. Go home. In the name of the Lord Jesus, my brother, go home and sent my daddy to a grave, brother. Go home tonight and never drink another drop and you're going to be all right. Let us say praise be to Almighty God who made the heavens and the earth. Sir, join yourself with some good full gospel church now. Live for Christ the rest of your days. God will use you. Not only you, but he'll cause others like you to come out and walk in this lovely light and someday... Meet me on where we shake hands on the other side. You remember I'll call to your attention on the platform tonight where God delivered you of the drinking habit, where you accepted him as your Savior. Oh, my people, why don't you believe our Lord Jesus Christ? Be reverent. Well, the next day, a blot of blood came on the pillowcase where his ear had opened. And then later, I led my own daddy to the Lord Jesus. And my dad would say to me, Sis, when you send your money to Brother Ranham, why, my money's in on the kitchen table. And I knew that daddy wasn't too far um, behind in being saved. My dad was leery of Christians because he, he didn't really think. And I said, well, daddy, Jesus wouldn't do anything wrong. So 
we would just look to him. And uh, my dad would go to meetings with me up in Chicago. He went with me down in Jeffersonville. And uh, then I went through life like that, just witnessing and testifying. I heard Brother Adam say about woman preachers, and I didn't want to be a woman preacher. But, <coughs> excuse me. But the, I, I went to him and I asked him, I said, but then Brother Branham, what can I do? And he said, well, Sister Rosella, he said, don't you ever fail to witness for Jesus Christ. So I said, all right. And um, then later I was married. Uh, Gene and I got married. And uh, he had a year to go to retire out of the military. Well, then when he retired, we came back to Illinois. We came to the tabernacle and uh, I asked, I, want, I need to see Brother Branham. Well, we walked in the old deacon's room, and Brother Branham was uh, reading that portion of the deacons. And he turned around, and I had led Jean two days after we were married to the Lord. He was under the blood. But I said, Lord, I've got to know that Jean is sealed. I've got to know it, Lord. It, it was just like something hitting my heart, just pounding it. I, I said, I've just got to know that he's sealed. I, I can't live if you don't let me know that, Lord. Brother Branham turned right around and he said, Sister Rosella, he said, one day, Brother Jean, he had never met my Jean. He said he was going plumb this way and he drew a circle. And he said, God has turned him around and now he's going plumb this way. And in my heart, I looked at Brother Branham and I said, I, I said, thank you, Lord. Inaudibly, of course, but Brother Branham meant, knew what I meant. And then Gene, not understanding, but then just four years ago, God opened it to him who, everything about the message and, and about God, the things of God. And, and I knew that, that the Lord had to change Gene because if I was Abraham's seed, then God would answer my prayer. And then I've gone to jails and um, prisons. Uh, just everywhere, given a lot of people w probably wouldn't um, lower their self, but I don't feel that I'm lowering myself because um, Jesus loved me and he came and rescued me. And my, as my mother was praying, God sent Brother Branham to Hammond and uh, I could talk to him on the telephone. I've got a whole great big book of the different things that he told me that I can lean on. And one time the, the girls in the office had it, and oh, they thought that I was so funny. And he said, remember, Sister Rosella, there'll never be a person be able to lay a hand on your life. It'll never happen. And it, that's so, I, I know that that's, that's got to be the truth. And so many people tried to straighten me out since I've been saved. They, they wanted me to go this way and that way. And, uh, Pentecostal preachers up home, so many of them, I loved them, their wives, so that they'd come by my mother's and dad's and they'd try to, they'd say, Rosella, the only thing we preachers and everything have against you, you really living for God and your life is different and everything, but you just go to those meetings. And I said, well, if I was following you all, I'd be fine, but since I don't do it that way, then you don't. They, they said, well, you're all right, but you'd be just better if you'd follow us. But I, I never could feel that way. I, I had to come to the meetings of Brother Branham's because he, he really was my spiritual daddy because he, he introduced me to Jesus Christ. And if I ever had any problem, then I went to Brother Branham. And I, I, if I was in, in, had problems or, or at work or anything, or for other people, I call Brother Branham and um, get to talk to him. And uh, he would pray with me over the phone or tell me he would pray later. And uh, he'd always encourage me that it would be all right. He told me that my daddy would be all right, that he'd be praying. That's all I need to know, that he was praying with me about my daddy. And um, it, it, it just was so wonderful to get to go to the meetings because to me, that's all I lived for. Now, the people that I went to jail services with and everything there in Joliet, they had a big Cadillac that they'd take their meet, uh, vacations in, and they had a little Ford they got groceries in. Well, one year, they had gone to Florida, and uh, uh, 
I said to Brother Branham, but Brother Branham, they all went to Florida. He said, yes, Sister Rosella, but you have chosen the finer things of life, Sister. And I, I felt so ashamed because I knew I did. I guess I just needed to be. My daddy couldn't encourage me because he, he really didn't know the Lord then. And, and uh, well, there never to me, there never was a man as Brother Branham was. It, he displayed to us and walked as Jesus walked. I believe that he took, he took the very pattern and walked it here on earth and showed us exactly how Jesus was. My daddy went in 69, and he's with Brother Branham. My mother went two years later, and I'm an only child. But one time I said something, Brother Brown, that I was an only child, and he said, yes, but you have all kinds of brothers and sisters, Sister Ozella, through the royal blood of Jesus Christ. A lot of times claim them, but sometimes I wonder if they claim me, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I know that if you've ever had it revealed to you that your name is written there, it'll never, it, the world can never change you. And I know that where I was such a problem to the world, the doctors, my mother and dad, I'm ashamed of it. I, I wish I could undo it. But I can't. All I know is that God came down and healed me, helped me, and now I want to witness for Jesus Christ to tell men and women that there is a way out, and that way is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Did you ever have uh, a Christian background and your recollection of ever coming to any knowledge of the Lord as a child? No. I knew about Him, but I didn't know Him. I went to Sunday school and church, but I didn't know Him. With any Christian experience that you ever had prior to what you said being converted, do you ever remember being satisfied with any with anything in life? Never. Uh, I've read your life story, and you can say things as you feel. I'm asking these questions, Rosella. After your school days, your life in your alcoholism began to take on a different pattern. I noticed you said that your daddy bought you a coat and different things, and your way of, your structure of life changed. The, you mentioned an evil spirit of alcoholism where you would hide things and do things. What about that? How did your, when did you see your life just drastically start looking ugly to you? Well, um, oh, probably a year and a half before Brother Branham uh, came to Hammond, I, I realized that um, uh, that I needed help. And uh, I went to doctor after doctor. One doctor gave me nerve tablets that if I'd have stayed on it, I would have been a, a dope addict. Um, you mentioned hiding liquor in your clothing mm -hmm. and, and uh, explain that to me. And ha I had a fur coat that if I fell down in the snow or something, I wouldn't die. But, uh, yeah, uh, and then my, my daddy would find it and he'd be aggravated with me. But my parents neither one drank, so it was difficult for them to ever understand. It was an ashamedness to them, too. They didn't understand me. And then the neighbors didn't understand me, but then after I saved, uh, the little Catholic lady next door to Mom and Daddy, she says, Oh, Rosalia, you'll be such a good girl now. And I said, Oh, Granny, not me be a good girl, but Jesus in me, he make me be good. And then she says, Oh, she, she understood. You mentioned, too, Rosella, that your mother stood with you and yes. supported you through this time. What extent did she go through to help you? Uh... She did all land. 
She'd put me in the hospital. She'd get medication. She tried her er, everything to keep me together. Um, she'd pray for me, even though she, she wasn't as deep as when I came in the message and when she was following me. Uh, but she she just didn't know she was at wit's end, knowing what to do with me. And the one doctor said that if, if I lasted another six months, my mind would have snapped. And I resented, and I was smart enough that, oh, I resented being just um, do the bidding of something that was beyond me, and I couldn't explain it. I didn't understand it myself. And I, well, I'd turned, I'd went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, they said that you would, um, the God as you understand him. And I said, well, no, it's God as the Bible declares him. But every day of that nine months that I stayed sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, I craved. Every day of that nine months, I'd get at the bottom of my bed and pray that God would keep me sober. He did. Now, that's before I saved. And, but I craved every day. Every day of that nine months, I craved. And my mother and dad didn't understand me. I don't think anybody would that's never went that route. But and when I went through the prayer line, then I've never craved from July the 11th, 1952, to now March of 86, 22nd or 3rd or something. I think it is important, Rosella, that we believe in communion and foot washing, and I think a question to a lot of people, uh, what happened to you when you went to the first communion line? And we like the thoughts that went through your heart and your mind, because I believe this is a question that, that many people, you know, wrestle with. Yes. Uh, the first time I was at, uh, I didn't have a church to go to, so I'd always come down to the tabernacle. And the first time I went to the tabernacle uh, for communion, uh, I thought, well, I had my mind made up. I'll take the bread, but Lord, I'll just bypass the wine. It'll be okay. And I had a great big question mark in the back of my mind. And as I approached the communion in the tabernacle, Brother Branham was standing there. Um, and I looked up, and Brother Branham said, be all right, Sister Rosella. And I thought, oh, my. I thought, oh dear, he's answering my prayer already. And so I just went ahead and took the wine and the bread. And I've never craved to this day. I take wine ever communion. Did you have any feelings when you took the wine? No. Satan bothered you? No, I just, I never have been, I've never been tempted. I've never been tried in that manner again. Never. You were delivered, huh? Mm-hmm. I was healed instantly. I really was. Rosella, too. The neighbors saw such a difference in my life. They just shook their head. They said, she went ex from one extreme. Now, look at She went to another one. And I thought, that's right. When you're not in this world right, the world will laugh at you. And then when I came into this extreme, into the, my mother and daddy's neighbors, they said, but look at Rosella. She's gone to such an extreme now that... She's went to a religious, she's a fanatic. And I thought, well, my, I can't please the world, Lord, so I'll please you. And I kept every day listening to my tapes, every day listening to my tapes. I come home after I say them, I listen to them tapes, and I said, this world isn't my home anymore, Lord. I'm going to do what Brother Branham told me to do. I'm going to walk like he said to the best of my ability. I'm going to, Lord. And I made up my mind. The neighbors and people, they don't want you when you're not saved. Then when you're saved again and go into, they think, religious fanatic, they don't want you then either. So I said, Lord, you know all about it. I'll just leave it in your hands. And I walked on. The world is a... They felt that you were an alcoholic. Now you're an extreme as far as religion goes. Perhaps. So what are we going to have next, huh? I don't know, but I didn't change. I just stayed right there. Mm -hmm. 
what about baptism in water? Uh, did you have a meeting with Brother Branham concerning that? No. What? Uh... No, I heard it, that Brother Branham was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I asked Brother F.F. F. Bosworth's um, son-in-law in Downers Grove to baptize me in Christian baptism. And uh, so he said, well, all right. And he got me out in the water and he said, Roselle, I now baptize you. In the name of the Father, I like to die. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. And I came up and I tried to be real sweet. I said, now, Brother Ferguson, I said, I ask you to baptize me in Christian baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you didn't do so. So when I get with a group of brethren or in, at the tabernacle or someplace, I'm going to be baptized again. And... Um, the preacher started coming by telling my mother, Mrs. Griffith, if Rosella does that, then she'll be, uh, what was the word, sacrilegious. I would be sacrilegious. And I said, no, I couldn't be. Brother Ranham said to be baptized that way. Here's the water. Here's the pool. You do it. And I said, I'm going to do it. So I came down to the tabernacle and Brother Neville baptized me. In 50, I believe, well, 56, I believe it was. We all, at times, wonder what it was like, Sister Rosella. We've seen Brother Branham in the meetings. We've seen him call the people out, and, and to us, it was uh, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Explain your feelings when you got close enough to him, perhaps the first time personally, alone, or when you could have had a little interview with him, what the thoughts were when you looked at him, and when you got close, as all humanity wants to get close, and you were fortunate to get close. Uh, what did you think? How did you go about it? Maybe how did you get your first interview? What happened? I, I never, I never was a scared of Brother Branham. I never was frightful. Um, you probably would understand why I said, but I was in awe in the same respect because I knew that there was a presence there that you could feel nowhere on earth and people just didn't understand me one time up at um, I asked to see Brother Brennan one time when one of the boys had that he I had to go through him and he said no I couldn't see Brother Branham, and I said, yes, I need to see him, and I asked him, thought I'd give him three chances to tell me no, and the third time he told me no, and I said, well, what I'll do is I'll go home to my motel room tonight in Chicago, and I'll pray. The God that I serve will tunnel under it, over it, around it, and I'll see Brother Branham tomorrow, and I twisted on my foot, and Mama said, sis, ought to talk to that boy that way. That was Brother Leo, but I said, yes, because I was desperate and I needed to see. That was my birthright, I believe, to the children of God. It was our birthright. And I clung and I believed if Brother Branham said something that was, if he told me black was white, and I, I had to have been looking at it the wrong way because he had to have been right. I was the guy that was wrong. You speak of all. Uh, did you uh, come close to him? Would he talk to you as a normal person uh, when you come into his presence? Yes. Yes, just like I was a, a, a sister, you know, just a sister with great respect, great human kindness, and godly kindness. You told Brother Branham one time that you loved him. Yes. Do you remember that? What was his answer? He said, I know you do, Sister Rosella, in Christian love. Did he tell you he loved you too? Yes. But he loved the whole world. He was such a Christian and prophet, but I really believe that he lived exactly the message that he brought to us. He lived it. That's what I want to do. You mentioned, Sister Rosella, that in your life story, too, that Brother Billy gave you the prayer card and that 
you leaned upon Billy. Uh, would you care to say something about that? I leaned on Billy. You said that he, Billy gave you a prayer card that you'll never forget that, and at times you I'll never leaned forget. on him and yes. help. Yes, I'll never forget Billy coming around. He was just a young boy, with pretty little old white long jacket and dressed so pretty, just mine. I thought, you know, and he seemed like he had such a care that he understood. And I thought, my, someday when I get over on the other shore, I'll be able to thank him enough. Did he help you with Brother Branham in your life and different things, Billy Paul? In my life? Did he help you get to see Brother Branham and help you? Yes. I'd always go to Brother Billy, and Brother Billy never one time told me no. I always would. Well, it was the, a lot of people, okay, they think to go to fly to Paris or to do this, that, or something else, but to be in the meetings was one of the greatest events in my life. At the end of your life story, you mentioned that Brother Branham told you that you'd received, that you'd received a prophet in a prophet's name. What, explain to us that instance. I didn't understand the scriptures. I was reading the Bible six, seven, eight hours a day, and, and I, I come across where if you received a prophet in a prophet's name, you'd receive a prophet's reward. And I said, Brother Branham, I don't understand that. He said, well, Sister Rosella, you might need that prophet sometime. And I did. I need him many times. Uh, I noticed that you had a story that you told in reference to Mrs. Short. You had a testimony. Yes. I marked that down. Uh, those people lived in uh, Lockport, Illinois. And she'd, um, oh, she was a Church of God. They were Church of God people. I didn't ever put my name on a church book after I saved, but uh, I loved those people. And uh, she had been healed two or three times before, but she called me this one time. She said, Sister Rosella, she said, you know, I'm fixing my bag to go to the hospital. And I said, why, uh, how come you're doing that? Brother Branham's having a meeting this weekend. If we go down, God will heal you. So um, they didn't have a lot of money, and they had three or four children. And my mother and I, well, everybody just piled in the car. And we had car trouble going down, and I was telling her uh, that the Lord had healed her. She had a big tumor. And so what I did was I told her, I said, well, you pray, and you ask the Lord to work, come and answer you through Brother Ranham, and he'll do it. Well, that was my life. She had never encountered it, so she didn't know. She said, Lord, as she sat in the tabernacle that morning, she said, that I might know that this is you. And she took her husband's big white handkerchief and put it up to her face, and she said, Lord, that I might know this is you. Then you have him speak to me, Brother Venom. And then also call my little girl, and I'll know it's you. So there was her husband and her, my mother and I, and a couple little ones, and her little girl was way at the end of the aisle. Uh, Brother Branham had preached his message and he was praying for the sick and he looked down and he said, well, here's the lady Sister Rosella brought. Yeah. She said, Lord, if this is of you, then, and, and I'm to be healed, then, Lord, uh, then you speak to me and then have him, Brother Branham, speak to my little girl. And so we waited just a minute and Brother Branham looked at him and he said, this lady down here that Sister Rosella brought is suffering with a tumor and said, and why, he said, at the end of this aisle, her little girl, well, that woman got up and she screamed. I challenge you to believe. I challenge your faith to believe. Here sits a lady here praying. Got her handkerchief up to her face. I don't know you. God knows you. You're from Joliet, Illinois, and you got a tumor. That's exactly right. You might wonder, yes, that's a, that's a woman Rosella brought. That's right. 
Wait, she told me about that, but she never knew I'd ever know the woman. That's right, this happens to be the woman's faith was great. Amen. I'll tell you one thing you, you know that I don't know. You're praying for this child sitting here on the end of the seat that's sick. That's your child. That's right. Amen. You know, I didn't know that. There it is. It's the Holy Spirit. Do you believe it? Do you accept it? Then if that's right, what I said about straight as the gate and narrow as the way is right. Amen. Jesus Christ, God's Son, is right here now. The Spirit of the living God is right here. Do you believe it? Amen. Then let you know that I'm not nobody to heal. I'm not a healer. But the Spirit of God just chose me to manifest Himself. I don't have no education. I have no knowledge of anything. But it's His Spirit that does it, you see. And He wants you to know that I've told you the truth. This is the truth. That Jesus Christ makes every one of you well right now. If you believe that. Now, just as if it worked in Kingston, which the missionaries or whoever it is back there seen it work in Kingston, by the thousands being healed, why won't it work here in this America where we have Amen. the way it is now? Why can't we believe it? Because we can't cross that little riffle yonder. Do you believe it? Raise up your hands. Now, those same hands lay on somebody next to you. Let me pray for him right here. Don't you have no more doubt in your heart. This will end it. And she went back to that doctor. The doctor could not find that tumor. And she said, that doctor told her, Lady, I am never going to tell you there's anything wrong with you. Because she's told him that God had healed her. <laughs> but she never did see what I saw. I, I don't know where she missed it. And I took um, the, what was it, water baptism. She never did see it. But she got that far. And I love those people. Yeah. Brother Branham had told me that, that one day uh, Gene was going one way and God had turned him around and he was going the other way. Well, that was in um, 1963. Uh, I believed exactly every word that Brother Branham told me, uh, even though I, I, I didn't... Uh, Gene said for me to go to the meetings and he understood that that was my life. Because we had talked about before we was married that I didn't want him to drink or smoke. He had to serve God and we should pray together. But I wanted him to have a the Holy Spirit in his life to guide him. And then, in nine, just four years ago, Gene had had a heart attack and God got him to where he could talk to him. And there, um, I was play, playing one day. I've got a, a thing in my living room bedroom and kitchen where I can play the cassettes and I was playing the unveiling of God and um, Jean was in the living room I was cooking and Jean hollered I see it I see it I see it I see it and he really saw what I had tried to tell him all those years he, he knew it was revealed to him he he saw it but up until then, he he just went along as just a, a nominal Christian. He he didn't. But when it was unveiled to him, and and he saw uh, God had given him a revelation of um, this message, and now Dean's uh, life is completely different. Where he can help me and tell me, well, Brother Branham said this, Rosella, and uh, we should do such and such. And it's so nice to see him when I believed for 20 solid years the promise that Brother Branham would give me. I'd have never gave up. If God had took me on, I'd have still believed that same promise that Brother Branham gave me. It had to come to pass. So uh, I would have seen him in, the, in heaven. I'd have seen him there. But God brought him now. When, when I'm older and I, I need help, he just said, well, you've had it long enough, Rosella. You, I'll just save him and bring him in, and y'all have a nice, happy life. And, and it's, it's been so nice, and there's nothing impossible with the Lord. All we need to do is to apply the token. Every family in this message that has children or unsaved loved ones or whoever they are, we're interested in our families. We want every one of them in there. We don't want nobody to be lost. We want every person that's heard of Brother Branham to come in and be saved and to be in that a member of, of the bride and be raptured when he comes because it will be Brother Branham that will introduce us to Jesus Christ. And I think that behooves us right now that we just sell out 
of the things of the world, the world, what they think, it doesn't really matter what they think. Heaven's our home. What were you looking for when you heard Jean say, I see, I see? What were you waiting for 20 years? Uh, I had to see a difference in his life that I knew that he was sealed. I knew it. Brother Bram said he was. Because when I prayed that day, I said, Lord, that I've just got to know that he's sealed. I needed to know that he, he had the Holy Ghost. He was only walking under the blood then. But Brother Bram said, we have to have the Holy Ghost to be raptured. <laughs> What difference did it make, Rosella? Oh. He said, I see, I see. What? Uh... He, he saw who Brother Branham was. He saw the message. It just opened up to him. He was a man that was over three or four hundred sailors. He, 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 he was ahead of things and over people that sometimes it takes the humble in heart to really see, see God. See, Brother Branham says, is to understand him, to... And, and, and it just happened in a flickering of a second. His life changed. The very next hour, he was thinking different. The next day, he was different. He, he just, I can't understand it. He started singing specials in churches and just praising God, for singing the great speckled bird and tell me his name again and different things. And Gene would never have done that before. He changes us. The Holy Spirit will, will burn out all the dross and what's not supposed to be there. And then he'll, he'll anchor that in that car. And Brother Ram said, that car will never be open till that day. Now I'm satisfied. I said, well, what was her name? Phyllis. I said, well, Phyllis, you know, Jesus said to him that's forgiven little, he'll love little. And I said it to her real sweet. I tried through the years to not go down to another individual's um, level, but to treat them with love. And, and it's hard to live in this, in this world, but I've tried to, now Gene will remind me now, if we have problems, he'll say, but how would Brother Branham react to it, Rosella? In what manner? And Gene's a help to me now, he'll, he helps me. I, I do uh, thank the Lord and, um, and I, I really am a, a Christian. I, I wouldn't have to do this because, as Brother Random said, I could sit on the river and never witness or preach again. But uh, my heart's desire is to win somebody to Jesus Christ. And by the stepping stones that I missed, by my life, if I could help somebody and direct their lives to look, there's a way out of anything or any adversity if they will look to Jesus Christ because he is the way the truth and the life he'll make a way where there is no way and I just thank God that that uh, my mother prayed and uh, I, I, I must have prayed in my heart that I, I want needed to be free and then God answered by sending his prophet to him in Indiana and uh, he told Brother Beeler, he said, uh, Brother Beeler, you dismissed it. What God sent me for just happened last night. And I thank the Lord uh, for everything that he's done for me. I thank him for how great he is. He can reach down because I was nothing, absolutely nothing. But by his grace and mercy and love, he's given me a brand new life. And every Bible that I own, I've got it underlined. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things are passed away, and all things are become new. And I love him with all my heart. And I love Brother Branham for bringing Jesus Christ to my life.